Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be able to introduce today's speaker, who is Professor Thorsten Joachims from Cornell. And Thorsten will be talking about how to build online platforms that are sustainable in the long run and that don't just maximize uh, short term engagement metrics such as clicks or likes or views. And I think Thorsten is perhaps one of the world's best researchers in this space in machine learning and information retrieval, right? I think he's one of the only people I know who has won eight uh, best paper awards and four test of time awards at top tier conferences. Right? And the absolutely amazing thing about many of these papers is that they're all single author papers by Thorsten. So Thorsten seems to be one of these supermen, right? Who can do anything. So not only does he identify the problem, but then he comes up with the idea, he implements the algorithm super efficiently, he builds the search engine and the recommendation platform, he gets fantastic results. And on top of everything, right, he even proves that it works. So as I said, right, he has these, he can do anything. And for this, he's been uh, elected a fellow of the ACM, a fellow of the AAAI, He's won the KDD Innovations Prize. He's served as the chair of the Department of Information Sciences at Cornell and so on and so on, right? Uh, the only thing that I think Thorsten can't do is speak good French. And I'm uh, proof of that, right? So Thorsten and I, we were at this ICML <laughs> in Lille in France. And I was telling Thorsten, man, they're just handing out bottles of beer everywhere. There's bottles of beer at the registration desk. There's bottles of beer for uh, breakfast. I can't get a glass of milk. So Thorsten, being the true gentleman, said, oh, I'm European. I'll solve your problem. I'll take you out for lunch, <laughs> and I'll get you a glass of milk. Right? So we go there, and he tells the waiter, hey, Mani could like a glass of uh, the French word for milk, lay, I think, right? And then, unfortunately, like that's fine, but the waiter brings me a big bowl of ice cream, right? Because I think glass <laughs> is French, like his ice cream. And <laughs> person in his true problem solving style, right? He solves the problem there and there. He lets the ice cream melt until it's milkshake, and then <laughs> that's my problem solved. <laughs> so I think he gave an amazing talk today, but I hope he steers clear of using French <laughs> during his presentation. <laughs> And I think we have a fantastic panel of moderators as well for Thorsten's talk. So we have Professor Soman Chakravarti from IIT Bombay. Uh, Soman is a recipient of the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize. Uh, it's one of India's highest scientific honors. He served as program chair of WWW and, and Wisdom, which are the top conferences for information retrieval along with SIGIR. And he's worked at Google and at many other places building top quality search engines. So has Manish Gupta from Microsoft. And Manish has worked on developing amazingly good quality algorithms at Bing. And I hope they will be asking Thorsten lots of interesting questions about his talk. Of course, we'd like to have, uh, we'd welcome lots of questions from you, the audience as well. So if you have a question, please type it out during uh, uh, Thorsten's talk. You can ask clarification questions, type them out in the chat. And then Somin and Manish, they'll try to unmute you so you can ask your question directly, or uh, they might just ask it on your behalf. It's, it's a simple question. And then afterwards, we've left about uh, half an hour to 45 minutes after the talk for discussion. So then we'll just unmute everyone and people can ask questions uh, directly. Uh, again, moderated through Somin and Manish. So with that, uh, Thorsten, the platform's yours, and we're looking for an forward to an amazing talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Manik, for the super nice introduction. Uh, there's one thing that I need to rebut and one thing that I need to confirm. The first thing that I need to rebut is that uh, this is actually what I'm presenting today, work with a lot of collaborators. Um, and uh, these are students and collaborators, undergrad, PhD students at Cornell who actually have done most of the heavy lifting on this work. Um, the, the thing that I need to confirm is uh, my language skills. Uh, they're, they're not just bad in French, they're also bad in Dutch. Uh, the last sabbatical we spent in Amsterdam and my kids picked up the language like nothing. And you know I was struggling and what happened pretty frequently is that my kids who were at the time like five and six, seven, um, actually apologized for my Dutch. So yeah, so I'll, I'll stay, I stay clear of any kind of uh, foreign languages here except for English. 
uh, a little bit of German may come up in the talk, but that's about it. I know German. So what I actually do want to talk about is um, AI systems, the systems we are building today and that we've built over the last 20 years, and the way that we've built them in a somewhat myopic sense. Um, so we've we've gotten very good at building these systems to optimize short-term metrics like engagement metrics, like clicks, purchases, things like that. But I think we're more and more recognizing that these systems have a second dynamic, a long-term dynamic that doesn't unfold on the, you know, on the level of a single query or of the level of a single recommendation, but that unfolds over weeks or months or years. And I think we are only at the beginning to be able to steer these dynamics. Uh, right now, we're not steering them very effectively, and we see some of the results that, you know, some of these platforms that we've built um, are not really doing what we want them to do at a global scale. So this talk is like thinking about what are the next really big challenges in building these AI platforms? Um, and, you know, what are the technical, real hard technical challenges that we need to get right to make these platforms work in the long run? And so, uh, Manik already said, I've, I've worked a lot on these types of AI systems. Um, these are systems that, um, you know, interact uh, about information. Um, and in particular, they interact through rankings. So, you know, rankings these days are almost everywhere um, in, in online systems. So they're certainly in search engines. Um, they're in uh, retail. Um, so, you know, this is Etsy. It's a retailer um, selling products. Uh, they're in media streaming. And rankings are also how we deliver news um, and information these days more generally. So, you know, there are lots of design decisions that go into these systems, but really where the AI sits is in this ranking function. And in this talk, I'll typically call it PI for it's a policy um, that, um, you know, takes some context, some query, some specification, some user model, and produces a ranking. That's where the AI sits, right? And we've gotten really good in producing these ranking functions, especially through machine learning. But I want to question that, you know, whether what we're doing these days is really enough and is also just the, the only thing that we should be doing. To get at that, uh, maybe to, to, you know, let's start at the beginning. Um, so let's start at the place where these kind of ranking functions actually came from. And so this whole field kind of came out of library science and then moved, you know, with together with computer science and it started sometime in the 60s or 70s when the first kind of deployed systems came uh, into place and they were standing in libraries, right? Um, so these ranking systems, you would go to a library um, and you would want to find a book on a topic that uh, you were looking for. So you could specify queries and you would get back a ranking that helped you find books. And uh, it was very clear what these systems were supposed to do, right? Um, they should help you find as many relevant books as quickly as possible, right? So you could think of it, you know, uh, what you want is you want to rank relevant books, books that are relevant to the topic the user is looking for, to the top of the ranking. Find as uh, you know, show as many as possible relevant books. But then in the mid 90s, things changed. These systems moved out from a library or from some analyst desk. Uh, into our living room and into our society, right? So 1994 was when the first search engines actually um, came up. And all of a sudden, these AI systems, you know, they were still pretty primitive those days, but, you know, they were using, they were quite intelligent already. Um, they, were, they were moving from these specialized domain to become part of our society and of our institutions. And today, they're really just about everywhere, right? As I said, they're mediating e-commerce, they're mediating media streaming, they're mediating news. And so now the question is, um, you know, what, what are the goals of these systems today, right? I think one of the things that we're doing is we're still treating them like the systems we built in the 70s, um, you know, maximizing utility to the users. But these systems are a lot more complex, right? 
they are actually embedded in our economy. They're embedded in our lives, right? Much of our communication gets made mediated by these systems. So the goals are arguably also a lot more complex in these systems. And in the way that they interact with people, they develop dynamics that I think we can see, but that we can't necessarily control. So one of the things that's certainly different here is that these systems are mediating two-sided markets. And it's often the case that you have like a set of sellers and a set of buyers or you know, information providers, information recipients. And so there's a whole ecosystem, there's a whole platform that we need to kind of be aware of um, when we're designing these systems. And this whole platform evolves over time. So this is what I want to explore. Um, and I want, to, I want to start with the argument that, you know, if you look at what many machine learning algorithms and many systems are still doing, is they're basically doing that, right? They're maximizing utility to the users. And one way to do this, a very uh, kind of natural principle, um, is called the probability ranking principle. So if you want to, you know, if you have a query that comes in, and you can estimate the probability that each of these items, let's say a document or a product, is relevant to this query and this user. So let's say this first item has a probability of being relevant to this query of 60.99%, the second item 58.98%. You just rank items by the probability of relevance. And it's pretty easy to see that, you know, no matter where the user starts, stops looking through this ranking, the expected number of relevant results is optimized by this ranking that you produce by sorting by the probability of relevance. And so that maximizes the number of relevant items the user sees and makes it actually for many other common measures of ranking quality, uh, th this ranking also maximizes utility, right? How good that ranking is to the particular user's query. This is what we're still doing in many situations when we're trading a uh, ranking system these days. But here are a couple of examples why this can go pretty wrong uh, on a larger scale, on a long-term scale. So let's say, so this is a fictitious uh, ranking system. It's a database where uh, employers can go and search for resumes of job applicants. So there's Adam, Bob, Charlie here. They're all job applicants. They've submitted their resume. And now there is a, uh, and this is the ranking that the system now produces for uh, the query software engineer. So an employer comes, types in the query software engineer. This is the ranking um, that we get. And here my probability of relevance is, let's say the probability of that employer inviting that person to an interview for um, given this query. And let's just assume I get the probabilities of interview exactly right. I know them per perfectly accurate. Um, so what's wrong with this ranking? Actually, a couple of things. The first thing that you'll probably realize is that, you know, there's a lot of really qualified applicants. Um, and they have almost indistinguishable probability of being interviewed. Um, but somebody gets the top spot, that's Adam here, and somebody gets into position 100. And so one of the basic tenants, uh, so what, what happens is that, um, you know, whoever makes in position one, that's Adam here, gets a lot of exposure. It's going to be seen by a lot of employers, probably going to get a lot of interviews, right? But the person in position 100 here, Alice, um, hardly anybody's going to go with that far down, right? So the exposure that this person is gets is low, even though basically, you know, th this person is highly qualified, like 50% of the employers want to invite this person for an interview or 49.99%, right? 50, almost 50%. But of course, this person is going to get a lot less opportunity of actually finding a job. So exposure high, exposure low, even though the qualification is almost the same, and that violates one of the basic tenets of fairness, right? Fairness says if you are equally qualified, 
you should also have almost equal opportunity. And that's clearly not the case here. So there's also another thing that's wrong with this, right? It's actually not even good from a like social welfare perspective. Um, so Adam is going to get a lot of, going to see by everybody, gets a lot of interview invites, going to get, uh, you know, a lot of invitations, and, uh, but in the end can only pick one job. That means there's going to be a lot of other really qualified candidates that didn't get invited to any interviews, are going to be unemployed. And there's going to be a lot of unhappy employers that couldn't fill their position because they all bet on Adam, they all invited him, right? So there's going to be a lot of unemployment and low productivity because positions weren't filled. So social welfare is bad for this ranking in aggregate, right? Even though for this particular user, you know, that employer, um, we, are, we followed the probability ranking principle. There's also a third thing that you probably noticed, right? Um, you know, if all the people with stereotypically male names are at the top and people with stereotypically female names are starting in position 100 here. And the reason for that is because there's actually a bias in the employers. And there's, let's say there's 2% of the employers that are just biased against women and wouldn't invite a, a, invite a woman for a software engineering interview. Now that's a, you know, an arguably small bias, it's only 2%, but that bias has a huge influence on where the women are ranked here, right? And it has a huge influence on future op on their opportunity of being seen. So this ranking amplifies the small buyers and makes it much larger. And now think about what would happen if we start like naively learning from this ranking, um, you know, who is relevant. So for example, we now look at clicks. You know, the, the people at the top get a lot of clicks because they're seen. The people at the bottom here don't get that many clicks. And so we may mistakenly think that these are less relevant, right? Which is not the case. So this amplifies existing biases and we don't want that, right? We want to dampen existing biases. Again, another long term back. Let me switch domains. Um, so let's say this is like a streaming service and this is my recommendations and it's now ranking the artist by the probability that I would enjoy listening to this artist. You know, they, I, you know, there's lots of really good artists. Um, I'll probably only explore the top few here. Um, if that system now does this consistently also for other users, A1 and A2, A3, they're going to make a lot of streaming revenue, right? Every time an artist gets streamed, uh, they make a little bit of money. So these artists are going to become superstars. They, you know, make money. These artists, even though they produce good music, are probably going to drop out of the market because they can't sustain a living. It's not in the desire of the platform, right? They want to have a nice big supply of, of music. And this kind of shrinks the supply towards a small set of almost monopolists, right? Not in the interest of everybody, except for maybe the monopolists. And maybe then the final example of kind of a long-term dynamic uh, that um, happens even though you rank by probability of relevance is polarization. Let's say we have a news aggregator. This is like the front page, what the ranking that they uh, kind of unpersonalized that gets presented there. And um, so there's two types of users. There's left-leaning, right-leaning, and there's two newspapers, the left-leaning times and the right-leaning reviews. And maybe we just have a small kind of majority of left-leaning users. So their probability of reading times articles, like the left-leaning one is also slightly higher. That means this is the ranking that the system would present. And the right leaning users are going to say, oh, this platform is biased against us. Um, and they're probably going to abandon the platform, right? And so you just lost half of the user base. Again, it's not in the interest um, of the platform. It's not in the interest of the kind of an overall goal here. So these were a number of examples where this kind of myopic like let's maximize utility, the number of relevant documents for one particular query does not lead to a long-term dynamic that is sustainable for the platform. So in that sense, we are actually, you know, we need to think at a different time scale about these systems, not just optimizing for one particular query, but optimizing for that overall behavior of that system. 
And so I want to break this down into three problems. There's more, um, but I want to break it down into three separate problems um, of how to make, you know, how to reason about these long-term dynamics. The first one is what I've actually swept under the rug so far, namely the fact that we actually first have to estimate the relevances. And if we have bias in our estimates, we're screwed from the beginning, right? If, if we don't estimate um, relevance correctly, our system is just going to uh, not do the right thing. The second, you know, we saw in these previous examples that, um, you know, to both sides of these bi um, markets, there are fairness issues, right? Um, that, you know, some participants would not be treated fairly, treated fairly, and that leads to undesirable long-term dynamics because they're going to abandon or they, um, uh, uh, they, they, well, they stop participating. And then I want to step back and think more globally about how do we actually steer these systems um, uh, in, uh, so that we're not only optimizing short-term dynamics, but long-term. So but let me start with the first one, unbiased estimation of relevance. And it came up in this example with you know, the men and the women and the bias, and that gets multi uh, uh, multiplied. And one of the biggest biases in these systems is actually a bias that we are introducing ourselves, right? So the way that we typically train these systems is that we train them on past logs of what we've done. So we have a ton of data that looks like that. You know, here's a query. And we presented the results in this order, and the user clicked on number one and on number three, uh, four, right? And we have, you know, terabytes of this type of data. And then what we want to do is we want to have a learning algorithm that takes this data and produces a new ranking policy, a new ranker that hopefully is better than the ranker that produced this data. But what's the problem here, right? We're we've kind of already kind of stacked the deck against some of the results that our old ranker happened to rank below, right? And so if we just naively think about, oh, who gets the most clicks? Probably the highest kind of you know, influence is whatever we put into position one, that's going to get the most clicks, right? Not necessarily what's the most relevant gets the most clicks. The most relevant was down here, but fewer people saw it, and so there were fewer clicks on these items. So how can we deal with this, right? It's a bias that we've introduced ourselves. Uh, how do we nevertheless get unbiased kind of rankings and unbiased estimates of relevance? So let me think this through. So where exactly is the problem? here? Let me think this through with a specific example. So this is the simplest learning problem that you can have. You have two ranking policies. This is the ranker that you're currently running. And this is uh, a new ranker. Uh, and you just want to decide, should I stick with the old ranker or should I switch to the new ranker? The data that we've collected all comes from this ranker. All oh, right. OK, so let's say if, if we had fully labeled data, so if we paid somebody to actually go through and say, was this relevant or not relevant, right, red or green, um, then the decision which ranking is better um, would be pretty easy, right? We would come up with a metric. So let's say our metric here is the number of relevant or the ranks of the relevant documents. So the higher, the better, right? We want to minimize that. And so here, that relevant document is position three, six, and seven here. The average of that is five point something, right? Um, so this is our metric here. Here, the relevant documents are in position one, two, and four. The average of that is two point something, right? And uh, so according to our metric, you know, we would rightfully conclude this ranking is better than that ranking, right? It ranks the relevant documents higher. But if we only have click data from this ranking function, then our data looks more like that, right? So we see maybe that the user clicked on link number three, and we can conclude that that link was relevant. But if we, we don't really know whether down here the user didn't like the links or didn't see the links, right? So there's ambiguity here. And so if we take this, 
these rankings and now apply them to our other ranking. We're we're in a bad situation, right? We don't actually know whether these results are relevant. If we make a pessimistic assumption and say they're not relevant, we actually get to the wrong conclusion and say this ranking is worse than that ranking. And we would be making a mistake. So it turns out that we can't, I mean, there's just, we, we, you know, we have missing information. We don't know. Um, but how can we, despite this missing information, still eventually get to the conclusion that this ranking policy is better than that ranking policy? And I, switch, I slightly switched what I'm saying here, right? First, I said I want to decide whether this ranking is better than this ranking. And now I say, well, what I really want is whether this ranking policy over many different, this ranking function over many different queries is better than that ranking function. And that is actually a slightly easier problem because I now only have to kind of decide an expectation whether these rankings are better than that rank, those rankings. And that's the approach we're going to take. So um, how are we going to deal with these missing judgments, with these yellows here? And well, where we're going to go is basically that we're going to take a causal inference perspective and treat this similar to how you would do like or how you would do the estimation for a controlled randomized trial in medicine. OK, let me set this up a little bit. So we have our loss function. Loss function just, you know, let's say here just what we had before that we want to minimize the rank of the relevant documents, you know, relevant documents as high as possible. And this is just a formula for saying that. And now we have to connect uh, kind of what we can observe, clicks or purchases or whatever, right, to observable, to a kind of an underlying model. And one reasonable thing to say is if something gets clicked, if a document gets clicked, then the user must have seen it. That's what this O variable stands for. And we can assume that it was relevant. And vice versa, if something is relevant and seen by the user, it's probably going to get clicked. You know, modular noise, you can introduce noise here. Um, I'll, I, you know, I'll sweep it under the rug for the talk. That's pretty reasonable, right? Um, problem comes here. If something is not clicked, then it's ambiguous whether it wasn't seen by the user, it wasn't observed, or whether the user thought it was not relevant. And we need to tease these two apart, right? Those were the yellows on the previous slide. And it turns out that we don't actually like have to strap people into an eye tracker and follow which what have, what have they seen and whatnot. Wouldn't actually help that much. But what's sufficient is to just know the probabilities of observation. And these are often called propensities in the literature. So it's just a probability, uh, the probability that in this case, the user will see a particular document here. So it's basically just a number that says, what's the probability, Q here, that the user will see this document? That's 0.5. And the further you go down, the lower that probability probably, right? So what can you do? Once you know these probabilities of a user looking at it, um, you can actually correct through in what's called inverse propensity score estimation. And the idea is very simple. If I know that only half of the time people look at the third result, that means whenever I see a relevant result in position number three, there was an expectation one other relevant result, because the probability is 0.5 here, that I didn't see, where I didn't see a click. So every time I do see a click on a relevant result where the observation probability was 0.5, I divide by 0.5, it's like multiplying by two to make up for that missing observation. Or down here, if the probability was 0.2 of the user seeing this result, every time I do see a click here, I upweight it by a factor of five to make up for kind of the clicks that I'm missing. And so that gives this kind of boost to results that are lower down. That's exactly the right boost to give me an unbiased estimate. In expectation, there's only a two line proof. You can show that in expectation, this inverse propensity estimate is unbiased, meaning that 
it's exactly the right uh, uh, loss that we're trying to optimize here. Now, it's only correct in expectation, but um, we typically don't care about a single query. That's what I mentioned before. What we do care about is um, that we, um, uh, you know, that we can do learning, and that's a kind of an average over many queries. And so, um, what we can do now is we can get the expected, an unbiased and consistent estimate of the expected performance of a ranking policy, and then do ERM, um, just minimize training error, so to speak, um, and do learning that way. And um, so then there's two questions. One is how do we optimize this in a practical algorithm? The second one is how do we estimate the propensity model? Let's start with the first one. Um, so this is actually pretty simple. How we design algorithms. If you know a ranking SVM, you will look at this algorithm here and it's like, where's the difference? And the only difference is here that you divide by this propensity. So that comes from this inference propensity estimator. Everything else stays the same. Just an illustration, you could do the same thing with deep networks, and people have figured out how to do the same kind of bias correction also for other algorithms. Then the second problem is how do we now model these propensities, right? The probability that a user goes, sees a particular result, and the simplest model is called a position-based model, where you simply have one probability for each position that says, okay, Q5 is the probability that user will look at the result of position five, and it only depends on the position. Um, you can estimate these types of these propensities here actually very efficiently without putting people into eye trackers. You do little swap interventions, and even though you've never actually, you know, you never see a person, uh, one of your users, you can still estimate these cubes. There are a couple of ways of doing that. Austin, there's a so, quick question. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, do we need to sacrifice some traffic to estimate these propensities? Yeah, so for the propensity estimation, what you would typically do is you either use like an A-B test that you have already, or what basically what you do is you take a small slice of traffic and you swap some of the results. And these swaps are interventions that uh, help you deconfound um, position from observation and relevance. And that's how we do it. But you only have to do that for a very small slice of traffic. And then you can, you know, you can keep it. Okay. Also, so another, the, uh, another quick uh, clarification question. Doesn't the estimator have a high variance? Um, the, this estimator? Yes, I think. Uh, yeah. So each for each individual query, the, the variance is high. Uh, it's only correct in expectation. But if you average over many queries, it's just a sum. So by a weak law of large numbers, that estimate, you know, that variance goes down one over square root. Um, and so if you have enough data, variance goes down. I think that's actually one of the kind of key things to keep in mind. When you're dealing with data, um, you can fix variance. You know, there's uncertain, there's like, Inaccuracy that comes from bias, and there's inaccuracy that comes from variance. If you have inaccuracy that comes from bias, you get a green curve that looks like this. So let me ex explain this plot here. This is now running an um, experiment on synthetic data where we took the Yao learning to rank data set, simulated click data, and then uh, trained either one of these bias corrected ranking SVMs or a naive ranking SVM that just said, oh, click result is positive, everything not clicked is negative. This is the performance, um, average rank of relevant documents, the lower is the better. This is the amount of queries for training data. And so this is the performance of the logging policy, an average rank of about 13, a pretty bad policy. This is the performance of a policy that actually needs, that gets to see all the relevance labels, not just the clicks, but it knows the true relevances for everything. So this is as good as we can hope to get. This is when you train without the bias correction. You're training an, a biased objective. Your, opti your learning algorithm optimizes the bias objective. So even if you get more data, bias doesn't go away, right? Variance goes away with more data, but bias doesn't go away. 
And so you just more accurately like estimate the wrong thing. Um, if you do the bias correctly, uh, bias correction correctly, you may have higher error in the beginning due to variance. But if you get more and more data, you can count on the fact that the, vi the variance goes down and you get a consistent learning process that actually basically approaches the optimal performance. So that's one, I think that's really one of the things to keep in mind if you're dealing with large data sets, you have to take care of bias. Um, and then the variance you can kind of typically approach by getting more data. So what this shows is that you can do the kind of correct estimation of relevance, unbiased estimation of relevance, even though you have this bias that you're introducing yourself. Doesn't necessarily work for all biases, but um, the, um, you know, you can basically, um, um, you know, at least you're not in, in a sense uh, be, being fooled by your own biases that you've introduced. But what this still, so, what this still leaves you is we're basically just like back to the examples that we had, that we had in the beginning, right? So we've uh, kind of Tarkin, taken- Before you move on, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Uh, so uh, propensity seems like a function of the rank alone, but in reality, um, uh, the probability of clicking on something also depends on whether the apparent contents of it are subsumed by something you already inspected or clicked above it. Yeah. So are you suggesting that propensity is like a you know, stochastic averaging over that, those effects? Yeah, ideally you would want to also condition like, you know, on the type of query and we've done that. You can have a different like propensity curve for different queries, like for informational queries, people go further down than for navigational queries. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying also there's like dependency substitution, right? So people yeah. have also worked on uh, propensity models that now model the relationship between the items in the ranking. Um, yes, these are all, yes, there's a nice long line of work that kind of tries to make this ever more refined. Yeah, but in principle, uh, it's, it's a, you know, once you have the propensity, all of this applies. The interesting thing is now you kind of know what you need to get right, right? And you can build better and better models. Mm -hmm. So, but even if we get all of the relevances right, right? And in all of my examples here, we already had the relevances right, and we were still not happy with it because we had these issues of fairness and these kind of long-term effects that happen even if we have the perfectly correct relevances. And many of those were really fairness issues, right? These were issues of, uh, you know, um, how we're allocating the scarce resource of exposure among the items. Right. And items here are people, right? They, that really matters. It's not books in a the library. These are people, right? And it's whether they find a job or not. So, you know, if you want to have a long-term sustainable platform, we need to be fair to the items that are being ranked. And so, and the unfairness here comes from this disconnect between two almost, you know, two equally qualified people. You're actually equally qualified had very different or disparate uh, treatment, right? Got high exposure here, very low exposure here, which we thought was unfair. So we really need to, so need to think about more clearly what it means to allocate exposure in these models. Um, and the probability ranking principle did this on a very myopic way that create, could create these disconnects. So how do we, so first thing we have to like quantify what exposure is. And if you think about it, it's, it's just a probability that an item gets seen. And that's actually exactly the same thing that we had before with the propensity model, right? Uh, you can use that same propensity model um, also to measure exposure. So for example, you know, now I call it E, not Q, but the probability of being seen is modeled by the position where the item was presented. And we can do that also for groups. So for example, we can say uh, all the items by one seller should have a certain or have a certain exposure and that just comes from summing up where in the ranking these items land and summing up the exposure um, for a position there. And what we can now do is we can actually build a tight connection between exposure, that's the resource that we're allocating, and merit or relevance here. And we can define, define this function f. 
And we can do it in different ways. We can say we want to make the exposure proportional to relevance, or we can even go and say we want to make the impact, like how much revenue you're making, um, dependent on your merit. Um, but let's keep it simple. Let's just say just we want to have a constraint, for example, that says for each group, um, we can compute the exposure by looking at where they are ranked and summing up the positions. And for each group, we can compute their relevance. Maybe you have good estimates, um, like we're using some of the methods that we had in the previous section of the talk. And now what we want is we want to make the exposure that a group gets, gets proportional to the relevance. So that's a proportional allocation. And now we can't have that one group or one item gets uh, two items have, or two groups have very similar relevances, but two different exposures. We're kind of linking them together. So in principle, what we want to now compute is not just the ranking that maximizes the utility to the user. And here I'm using DCG as my metric. I switched metrics, but it's just something, it's a very common metric to optimize. I want to optimize this metric now subject to this proportional uh, allocation constraint. The problem is just this is really hard, right? It's an optimization problem over rankings subject to a constraint, and it's even often not even feasible, right? You can't, there's no solution because everything's discrete and would be combinatorial and very hard to deal with. But here's a trick how to make those tractable. And the trick is that we think about it in, not in terms of deterministic rankings, but in terms of stochastic probabilistic ranking policies. And so instead of like the ranking function pi always producing the same ranking in response to a query, we can think about a ranking function that's probabilistic and maybe produces this ranking with prob probability 52%, this ranking with probability 23%, this one with 20% probability, this one with 5% probability. And now, by just kind of moving around these probabilities, I can, in a smooth way, give items like uh, not just discreetly uh, uh, many uh, different exposure, but continuously much exposure. And if you think about it a little bit more, then if you want to compute exposure and if you want to uh, compute DCG, here's our utility metric, what you just need to know is the probability of item I ending up in position J. And you can compute both of that for that. And that's the key insight, namely that instead of optimizing over this exponential space of rankings, what we can just do is optimize over this kind of item by um, rank matrix. Um, of how likely are we going to put each item into each position um, and then optimize over that. So we're going from here, optimization over rankings, to here, optimization in the space of doubly stochastic matrices. And, um, and, and let's just hope that we can also go back, that we can go from a doubly stochastic matrix back to rankings, and it's going to turn out that this is possible. So what this means is that our same problem that we had before, but now expressed in terms of these double stochastic matrices, becomes a linear program, and that's easy to solve. So this is just a matrix notation for maximize the DCG, the utility, subject to the fact that P is a double stochastic matrix. And then the, con the fairness constraint was linear, so we can add a linear constraint here as well. That's really easy to solve, and we can do that pretty efficiently. Now, the last step that we need to figure out is, can we go from a doubly stochastic matrix to a distribution over rankings? And that is actually a known problem. It's called the Birkhoff von Neumann decomposition that can like decompose any doubly stochastic matrix into a convex combination of permutation matrices, basically rankings. And these factors here, thetas, they, uh, we can just sample according to these probabilities. So what you can do now is basically this method. You estimate the relevances. Hopefully you get that right. Um, define a fairness constraint, and then you can solve this linear program um, optimally and efficiently, and then get a ranking policy back to this Birkhoff from Neumann composition from which you can then sample. So what this looks like now is that, you know, in a conventional ranking, so we have, um, let's say two groups here, 
uh, of relevance is 82, 81, and 80 percent, and group two, 79, 78, and 77. If you just use the probability ranking principle, you have this conventional ranking, we would rank, you know, this document in position one, this document in position two, all like deterministically, and that would be this W stochastic matrix, right? Because probability one, document one is in position one, and so on. That has a DCG of this. Um, but it's also unfair. This is DTR is our metric uh, of unfairness. Uh, one is perfect, 1.7 is not that good. If you compute a fair ranking, this is the W stochastic matrix that you compute. It has, oops, it has slightly lower uh, utility, but it's perfectly fair. And now you can sample, you do the Birkhoff von Neumann decomposition, you can sample from these permutation matrices. Um, and so in expectation, you are then fair. So that's one example where kind of the, you can intervene in the probability ranking principle and make things, at least in expectation over many queries, fair. But it's really just one particular problem that we're solving. Like we're creating, we're, we're solving this fairness to the item problem in one particular way. We're making it proportional. But there's actually a much bigger problem. Um, and, you know, how do we actually steer these systems more generally, not just the fairness? And what we fundamentally have is that all the metrics that we have and that we optimize, we're optimizing on a per query or on a per session metric. Um, 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 uh, basis, and then we're just summing up over sessions, and we are maximizing the sum. There are many problems that you just don't model well in this way. So uh, think about your diet, right? Um, if you know, my favorite thing that I can't resist is potato chips, um, and if I you know, if I wanted to like maximize kind of myopically, the, the, you know, I would get a ranking of my favorite foods and potato chips would be at the top. But that certainly isn't a healthy diet, right? Um, so that would maximize engagement probably. But over time, that would not be a kind of satisfying, it would not be a good diet for me. But it's something that we simply cannot express in the types of Kind of machine learning algorithms that we have today or that uh, that we use and so we've been thinking about you know what where's fundamentally the problem there and what what's missing and at a high level i think what's missing is that we've been doing kind of microeconomics we've been working at the level of here's an individual action that we're taking we're presenting the ranking and here is a metric that tells us how good this ranking was. And then we are maximizing the sum of these uh, metrics. So it's like engagement through clicks, purchases, likes, streams, and all, you know, and all these micro interventions that we can take, like how should we compose the ranking, uh, which artwork should we use, and things like that. But it's fundamentally limited to sums, right? Um, if you think about how we're you know, again, economics, right? There's microeconomics and there's also macroeconomics. And macroeconomics doesn't think about individual decisions, but thinks about our like economy in aggregate, right? And how it develops long term. And we have things like uh, the gross domestic product or inflation rate, uh, unemployment rate, right? These are metrics that we're using at this macro level. Um, and they're not functions of individual decisions. They're functions of an aggregate. And on these platforms, you may have similar metrics like user satisfaction. Uh, how big is my supplier pool? How much am I polarizing? And things like that. Um, and those are the metrics that we want to optimize in the long run. But what I argue is that we haven't actually managed to connect these two planes, right? We don't know how to do this microeconomic optimization to maximize user satisfaction. And we are just de dealing with these sums. So 
we don't know how to take macro interventions like in an economy. We would, for example, have a macro intervention like raising the interest rate um, and breaking it down into the microeconomic problems. And it's a little bit like, um, you know, we've engineered an airplane fuselage, right? And we've put in all of the controllers and the motors to the, um, uh, you know, to the um, to the rudders and to the engines. We've done all of this, but we haven't connected it to the cockpit yet, right? There's no easy kind of joystick that lets us fly the airplane. Instead, what we're currently trying to do is we're trying to fly this airplane from here to New York by like changing voltages, right? By like making small things like changes down here to our metrics or so. And that can't be the most efficient way of doing this. So what we've been thinking about is actually building an interface of, you know, if I have my macro goals, how do we break it down into micro interventions? And how do we do it in an optimal way? And in particular, what we want is we want to achieve these high level goals. Um, and but we also want to keep like engagement high engagement high. I mean, engagement is a good metric. It's just not everything. So we want to be able to specify macro interventions and then kind of find the optimal micro interventions that are consistent with these macro interventions. So let me give you some examples. So at the microeconomic level, it's all clear, right? We have our session metrics like click through rates and things like that, and the micro interventions like the rankings. At the macro level, we may have, let's say, some of the following. So like we may have that for me as a user, you know, if I use a, uh, let's say a music streaming service, uh, like the highest engagement typically you get by showing me the artists that I already know. But after a while, that service is going to become boring, right? I'll never discover anything new. I get tired of it, right? So there's probably a macro intervention that I want to um, have that says, you know, do expose Torsten to some new artists so that the system doesn't get boring. Or there's a macro intervention that says, don't send Torsten more than three push, push messages per week, otherwise he gets annoyed, right? So these are metrics that live on a weekly or monthly level, not on a session. Same thing for the items, right? So for example, if you have a new artist and we want to give that artist a chance to be discovered, uh, we may want to guarantee that artist to be exposed to at least that many users, right? Not in every query, but over a week, we want to provide some exposure. Or we maybe have a supplier that we made a contract with. You know, you are an exclusive supplier, and so we don't have to compete on price. And uh, we give you that much exposure in return over a week. So how can we take these macro interventions and break them down into optimal micro interventions? And what we've done is we've taken a control based approach. Um, so this is now our time scale of a macro intervention, let's say a week, Monday through Sunday. And what my macro intervention here, my example is that over a week exposed me to Delta many new artists, um, just to keep it interesting, right? And so what I could say is there's like a target, um, you know, over a week, um, I need to get to Delta over the many days. And then there's a state, right? I start down here and that's actually how many new artists was I um, exposed to. And uh, I can now measure an error, right? And if I see that, oh, I'm, you know, I'm lagging behind, I haven't seen enough artists, we can use this error to kind of crank up, I don't know, promote artists that I don't know yet, so that at the end of the week, I'm going to hit my target. Now, it comes at a cost, right? So this would be the engagement, like how many clicks I'm making without any intervention. And this is now with the kind of new artists promoted, I'm less likely to click on them. Um, so there's a cost. That's this red area here, right? That's uh, my loss in engagement. So the way that you can simply do that is very simple. It's a you know simplest way to do it is a P controller. So let's say there's a group. Those are all art artists that are novel to me. I can compute this arrow, just what I had graphically on the previous slide. And then basically what I do is I sort not only by relevance. That's what I would normally do, probability ranking principle. But I would also compute this error. You know how close am I to my target exposure? And then uh, promote all of the artists in this group, the new artists, by 
some factor lambda times the error and kind of push them up. And the bigger the error, the more they get. It was very simple. Um, it does get tricky when you have multiple constraints, maybe not just one group, but many groups. Um, and then you have to pick all of these lambdas. Um, so that makes it a little bit tricky. It's also that this controller isn't necessarily optimal um, in terms of how it can um, kind of maintain high engagement. And you can see this, for example, in this uh, um, uh, mock-up here. So maybe what's actually true is, it is actually true for me, that I'm much more willing to engage with new artists on the weekend. Uh, I have more time, right? Um, and so, you know, a smart controller would do the following. It would maybe not expose me to new artists during the week, because it knows this fact, right? And then only on the weekend start pushing new artists, which gives me better, uh, which kind of make, keeps the uh, overall engagement or loss in engagement as small as possible. So, but for, to be able to do that, you need to be able to plan. But there's controllers for that too. For example, a model predictive controller can do that. Uh, our model here would be just um, maybe data that reflects um, how I behave on each day of the week. And then what I can optimize is like the overall expected engagement um, from this query and what I can expect in for, uh, kind of in the future towards the rest of the week. Um, I can again do this in the space of W stochastic matrices. Um, I can use the Burkhoff trick afterwards. So I just need to make sure that these matrices are W stochastic. Those are linear constraints. And then I have my exposure constraint, which basically says the past exposure maybe on a Wednesday, um, plus the exposure from this time step, plus the exposure from the future time specs that I can expect have to reach my target. And it's again a linear program. I can actually solve this. Now solving this online would be quite expensive. So we've done kind of work on how to make this efficient. And it turns out you can, under mild assumptions, you can solve, you can actually make this quite efficient. You can also turn this into soft constraints, and it's very easy to actually have multiple constraints here. This is just a linear program, just add them. So what this shows is that I think it's useful to think about like the next generation of systems that we build, also in terms of microeconomics, and that we build this control layer here that lets us translate these macroeconomic interventions into the optimal microeconomic interventions. And then we can do causal reasoning, and uh, exploit all kinds of insights from the social sciences um, at this level, where we can actually now talk about relevant quantities like user satisfaction, which is very different to talk and then talk about user satisfaction here. And it also is a kind of area where regulatory policy can maybe um, come in. So with that, I want to wrap up. Um, so what I hope I kind of sensitize people to in this talk is that building these AI platforms, the ones that we have, and also the ones that we'll have in the future that are more in the physical space, there's really a whole kind of, there's two levels on which we want to optimize them. There's the short-term level, but then there's also this long-term sustainability level um, that you really need to think about um, so that these um, systems develop in collaboration with people in a desirable way. And the three aspects that I wanted to point out was that they need to be unbiased, they need to be fair, and we want to build them so that they're actually steerable. And we are not like changing voltages to fly a plane from, uh, from here to New York City. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so papers are at this website. Thank you so much, Thorsten. Uh, Samin Manish, you want to take over the questions? Right. Uh, thank you, Thorsten. So um, yeah, maybe we can start with a few questions. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I think, uh, folks, if you have more questions, please feel free to put in the chat window. Uh, there's a question from Nitin Agarwal from Lois. Um, uh, the, uh, is there any paper to follow? Uh, for doing the position switching to get the data by not having position bias. Um, also, some more thoughts on how much traffic is enough. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in, in, so there. Should, oh, sorry to interrupt. Maybe I was thinking that if Nitin is here, maybe he could ask his question. 
right and, and, and probably that. add add more more things if you would like to uh nitin are you around maybe thorsten you can answer the yeah. question yeah. and then yeah, I'm here, Manish. Sorry, I was unmuting myself. So uh, I think uh, just a uh, direction from point of view of real systems, how we can do it in a disciplined way to direct traffic while not making our customers unhappy. So that was some idea I wanted to understand from Prof. Like, hey, what is the good way to go about doing this? And how do we see that, hey, this traffic has achieved uh, good enough of data points for us while not uh, going in a direction where we do it too much? Uh, and that was particular about the position bias estimation, right? Um, like estimating how how people, um, you know, how far people actually go down. Um, yes, by, in general, yeah. how do we understand the positional feedback from users? Yeah, so um, we can. Um, so as I said during the talk, we could either like explicitly put like small interventions in there and actually flip results. But as you point out that has some negative impact, right? Um, we're, you know, we're messing with the rankings, could make the customers unhappy. Turns out, um, if you um, already have a, um, let's say you've run an A-B test where you've compared two ranking functions, and then what you will naturally typically get is that, you know, this ranking function put a result into this position, this ranking function put the result into that position, right? And um, now there was a 50-50 probability that a user saw this ranking or that ranking. And it turns out that, like from a statistical perspective, this is actually identical to explicitly like flipping the two, right? Takes a little bit of thinking about it, but it's actually, it's actually the same. So if you have data from some A-B test um, in an operational system, that's already enough uh, typically to just uh, estimate these position propensities. Um, so you don't actually, in a, in a sense, it comes at no cost, additional cost uh, to use uh, to customer satisfaction. Got it. I think that answered it so that uh, we can look at those uh, offline logs to understand these things and not uh, uh, as a part of A-B test, we can get that feedback and not specifically have to go about doing that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Manish. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Vaishak, can we please unmute everyone so people don't waste time unmuting themselves? Sure, Monica. Common I'll change the settings. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, next, I think I, we can invite Abhishek. Abhishek, uh, uh, you had quite some questions, so please feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, you know ask them. Not sure if you're around. Uh, Anish, maybe you can summarize the question while Abhishek is unmuting it. Yes, yes. So uh, Abhishek um, had, uh, um, I think the first question was how to handle uh, this, uh, how to handle cases when relevance itself is low from a group just because it is a new seller or a new group and how to also handle exposure in these cases. Yeah, so like on top of like, like uh, what I swept under the rug here is that um, th there's many different way, uh, many different reasons for not going by the probability ranking principle. And one of the reasons is uh, expiration, right? That it's basically that we don't have uh, like perfect estimates yet of how relevant an item is. And kind of a a way to get better estimates is what we need to expose that item to uh, to the users to actually see to, to estimate the relevance. And so, um, yes, I, I, so there there is another kind of mechanism at place that's this expiration mechanism uh, that also um, kind of requires us to perturb the rankings and not just go the probability ranking principle. And so that goes into like online bandit learning, and we've also done some work um, of like how do you actually collect, um, you know, maybe you have some data already about relevances. How do you now sample new data that kind of best fixes the kind of holes that you have in the existing data that you already have? 
Um, yeah, so that that certainly comes into play here as well. And um, so I maybe I should have had this as a you know expiration as another bullet that we have here. Because if we don't do proper exploration, we are also unfair, right? Um, so if there's like a new artist coming up, right, and we never expose that uh, that artist, then you know we're um, we're basically shortcutting the career of that artist. Um, oh, yep. Uh, Abhishek, can you please try unmuting yourself now? I mean, hopefully it should be working. Otherwise, there were some other good questions, and I can uh, probably ask on his behalf. Uh, for the PID controller, uh, for, for the for the P controller uh, that you mentioned, uh, we need to know the ideal behavior to calculate error. How are we calculating the target or ideal behavior there? Yeah, that's I, I, that's a very good point. And um, the so what what I've done in my plot there is I've just said, oh, let's do a linear interpolation, right? Let's start midnight on Monday, and just do a linear kind of interpolation to midnight the next Sunday. But that's certainly not optimal, right? And part of the reason why we went to this planning controller is because we didn't want to do this, right? And what the planning controller actually does, it realizes that, oh, we shouldn't have a linear curve. What we should have is we should start, you know, like during the week when I'm not in the mood for like exploring new artists, you know, I shouldn't, my target should be really low. And then only crank up that target um kind of towards the weekend um so the the planning controller kind of does that automatically and and naturally and that's why i think it's uh, um you know that's one of the big advantages of um, of going that route right. but I, I could potentially also think about trying to predict that target curve for the p controller uh but it's not clear how exactly to do that uh, one question a am i audible Yes. Yeah. Hi, this is Abhishek from Misho. So one of the questions that I have is like uh, during the special events, do this PID controller need any special adjustment or, uh, or or all this fairness and whatever we have done, do they need a special adjustment during special events like sales or something? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood the question. So the question is that when there are special events, let's say a sales event, uh, oh, um, I mean, in a way, maybe that sale event is a um, um, I guess it could come in two different ways, right? A sale could affect the relevance, right? Um, if you have a model that, uh, you know, you know. If the price is at a particular level, then it becomes relevant to more people, right? So maybe price goes into the relevance model. But maybe it wouldn't be a sale. Uh, another example is, for example, a promotion that you're saying, OK, I'm doing a promotion this week on a particular group of items, right? Um, and that you could then. Um, specify as one of these long term constraints for a controller, you could say something like. OK, I want to I want to expose, you know, I want to expose this promotion to. Uh, you know, a thousand customers. Um, do it in a way that uh, least hurts my uh, my engagement, right? What that basically means is, you know, show this promotion to the people uh, who where, where it's actually relevant, right? And plan it throughout the week so that um, you know at the end of the week you've exposed it to a thousand customers, but you've done the least harm in terms of engagement. Right. So that's um, it's not exactly a sale. Um, it would be more of a promotion there. Right. That's how we could like specify promotions. Uh, yeah, um, um, uh, thank, thanks, Tolson, for all these. Uh, uh, yeah, I think there are several more questions, interesting questions. Maybe I can ask one that I had uh, in mind, right? Uh, so, uh, utility maximization from long term perspective, as well as uh, like multiple utility functions, have been also studied in the computational ads world, where there are several parties and they're trying to optimize their utilities, uh, or also in the recommendation systems world. 
for example uh, in job recommendations uh, um, a recruiter may not want more applications for a job if it has crossed let's say 100 applies right so in, in some ways they are pretty related to what you discuss so sort of can you please comment how do these approaches compare with those approaches in typically traditionally people have followed in the ads versus recommendation system yeah world? yeah and i i think we have like similar kind of local solutions to various of these problems right um especially when it also comes to things like for example matching markets right where you have a bigger system of uh or matching markets even under constraints where you have a bigger system of you know um applicants have to like the employer and the employer has to like the applicants right there has to be a bi-directional match there's a capacity constraint of how much an employer can um actually review right maybe just 100 applicants or so how many um uh, uh kind of job ads each applicant can review right um and um so i think those are all cases where we do a global optimization um and um so i think they fall into a similar um uh, uh kind of terrain um and I think that last part was trying to kind of take several of these approaches and trying to think about, okay, on a more abstract level, you know, what are we actually doing here, right? Um, and um, how can we formalize it in a way that um, we can actually articulate this connection between the kind of long-term objectives that we have and the short-term interventions that we can actually make um, in a in a more principled in the more uh, in a more global way. Got it. Yep. Yep. I think yeah, it'll be uh, if some of these. Uh, uh, I I agree. If some of these principled approaches have not been applied on these kinds of data sets. Maybe it's a good idea to see the generalizability. Yep. Uh, so I mean, you want to go ahead. Yep. Is uh, Soman there? I can't hear him. Same here. I can ask. Still yeah. here, can't hear. Can Manik, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Vaisha, can you check if Soman is around and uh, unmute him if uh, he's having any trouble? In the meanwhile, maybe I could ask a question and then maybe Manish can take some more questions from the audience. So, first thing, uh, all of this is is I think very important, um, uh, and I think we should definitely pay a lot of attention to it and try and incorporate it in the real world uh, search and recommendation engine we are building. But all of I think what you presented was premised on the fact that the retriever, which runs before the ranker, is uh, doing a good job, right? That it is fair, it has solved the propensity scoring problem, and so on and so forth. But I actually see almost no one working on the retriever, right? And those problems are much harder because you cannot get propensity scores on the retriever and so on and so forth, right? So do you have any thoughts about that? And can you point us to any work being done on addressing these problems at the retrieval layer, even before the ranker uh, kicks in? Yeah, what you mean by retriever is the, the first stage that produces the candidate set? Yep. That's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've actually, um, so Luke uh, Wong, uh, one of my students, has um, actually done some, uh, some work on this. Um, yeah, it's very tricky uh, at that level to, you know, A, A, it has to be fast, and B, yeah, things like estimating propensities, it's not clear how to do that. Um, the, and it's also often intractable because the candidate sets are so large that the propensities become so small, the variance becomes very large. Um, so one thing that we that we have done is uh, we've looked at, um, you know, can you specify uh, for that, you know, for that candidate set um, criteria that are based on that that make it possible that the next stage, the ranking stage, 
uh, is not like inherently limited. So for example, if you have a kind of first stage retriever that retrieves job candidates, but fails to include relevant candidates from some group, um, then the, the next stage is not going to be able to do anything, right? And so we've looked at the problem of um, if you have group definitions um, and you have a retriever, how can you ensure that you, you're, and, and, and you're running into the problem that maybe your retriever is very good for one group, gets the relevant, um, you know, lots of um, relevant candidates, even in a small set, and it's worse for another group. How do you kind of specify criteria that, set, that now say, from every group, my candidate set should have a certain number of relevant candidates? And what this means is that maybe for that group where the retriever isn't that great, you have to go further down to achieve more candidates, right? So we've looked at uh, this kind of from a calibration perspective um, and kind of coming up with uh, kind of uh, per group candidate set sizes that your retriever needs to retrieve so that in the end you have enough relevant candidates from that group for the second stage to then put together and reduce a ranking um, from. Uh, that was, but that was more on a, um, that you didn't use propensity scoring or things like that. Um, was a different, was more of a calibration approach. Thank you. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Uh, go ahead, so I mean we can. Ah, okay. I switched equipment. Okay, so Navin, are you online? You can ask your questions yourself, or I can ask on behalf of you. So. Oh yeah. So um, one of my question was about uh, uh, von Neumann Berkhoff decomposition. Is it unique? Uh, it is not a unique. Um, it um, there there's many decompositions into rankings that. Um, basically produce the same W stochastic matrix that give you the same exposure. Yeah. And we've looked a little bit about uh, also into how do we, um, uh, you know, uh, among the many different decompositions, uh, many of them are small, um, uh, which one to pick? And so, for example, again, Luke, uh, Luke Wong, um, he has an interesting algorithm to uh, not just pick any of these um, decompositions, but for example, to pick uh, one that also satisfies that each individual ranking is, let's say, diverse, covers many aspects of a problem. Um, so I think there's there's actually really interesting research um, questions. I think that we really haven't, uh, you know, in the community looked at. Um, how do we have Birkhoff von Neumann decompositions or style decompositions that also have secondary um, criteria like diversity that they're optimizing? Or a criterion that says uh, that have minimum variance. So, like, you know, you can, you can get a doubly stochastic matrix um, or the kind of the numbers, the exposures in a doubly stochastic matrix, let's say, by presenting for a particular document, document A, by, you know, 50% presenting it in position one and 50% presenting in position 1000. And that gives you an exposure of a half. But you can also get an exposure of a half if you always put it in position two, let's say, or always in position three. And so you can also think about, can you get a book of a Neumann decomposition that kind of minimizes variance? So that you know between these different samples, the rankings don't change that much, right? So that you know different users that happen to get you know this sample from the work of Norman decomposition don't have like fundamentally different experiences, right? So there, I think there's lots of interesting kind of new decompositions uh, to explore there that have these kind of secondary guarantees, not just matching this W stochastic matrix, but matching it under minimum variance or maximum diversity or Many other criteria. No, very interesting. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Naveen had another question about the need to 
design so many steering policies. So there could be lots of criteria and wouldn't it be nice to have a method that doesn't require separate engineering? Um, I mean, in a way, uh, this model predictive controller that I had towards the very end, it's kind of a very generic way of taking any kind of macro level constraint that you want to hold over a certain time window mm -hmm. and breaking it down optimally into, you know, which ranking should I pick in which situation? So from that perspective, it's quite generic. We don't actually have to engineer you know, something specific for each of these interventions that we want to make. Um, and that was part of the goal of this research, right? To elevate all of these kind of special solutions to something that is generic. And then we can talk about, you know, at this kind of hide all the complexity behind an API. And then below this API, things are actually much simpler, right? You know, if you think about macroeconomics, um, you have, you know, maybe a do or also for this platform, you maybe have a on the order of dozens of different parameters that you're dealing with. You know, uh, the interest rate, the uh, gross domestic product, uh, and you have some interventions that you now know. Maybe you have a causal model, and it's, you can estimate a causal model of, you know, how does changing the interest rate affect the unemployment rate? It's hard to estimate these, but you know we have techniques for trying to do that. So now at this macro level, things are actually much simpler than because you're behind this extraction barrier that abstracts away these millions and millions and millions of decisions that we're making at the micro level. If you had, we directly wanted to have a causal model from like that micro level to like customer satisfaction, it just seems like a super hard problem. Also, if you wanted to do reinforcement learning, we wouldn't want to do reinforcement learning at this micro level, um, just in the same way that we wouldn't want to do reinforcement learning for a robot, um, let's say by changing voltages uh, on your autonomous car, but we have an API that is the steering API that you just say turn left by five degrees, turn right by five degrees, and it does all of the things about the you know voltages to the controllers and the slip of the wheels and all of the stuff right gets hidden behind this layer. And I think what we're trying to do here is to also have such a layer, not just like in a physical system like a self-driving car, but also in this online system right that hide all of this messy complexity. And where you just give like a command to the controller and it executes it in an optimal way. So that's part of the vision. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so um, there's another question about uh, Rajul Anand asks. Uh, well, uh, first, Ravneet. Ravneet asks for estimating modeling or uh, propensity. Just the position might be too simplistic a parameter. So this is along the lines of what I mentioned earlier. Can we add other parameters for estimating this as well? For example, we know that contrast attracts attention. Maybe contrast between lengths of suggestions uh, may have a higher propensity even when present down further down the order, etc. Yeah. Right. Um, so. Um... We've actually tried. Um, so it's it's. Uh, we've actually tried to train a deep network um, to basically produce a propensity curve for each individual query based on all kinds of like features that you're mentioning. So, for example, one feature could be: is it an informational or a navigational query? People behave differently, right? Is it a query where we have? Um, uh, you know, mixed results. Is it a query where something is highlighted? Um, is it a, you know, you can have lots and lots of um, features that describe the type of query that you have and the, how you're displaying it. And then predicting, um, you know, what is the probability that somebody sees something, some particular item on that, on that page. We 
you can use the same kind of randomization or implicit randomization techniques to estimate the now the parameters of these deep network. And um, I think we got fairly good at predicting better propensities. The thing where it was a little frustrating was that to use these propensities and use them for training didn't actually make that big a difference. So um, I don't fully understand why. Um, it did make some difference. Um, so, but the kind of simple position based model was kind of frustratingly good uh, in terms of just using that during learning. But maybe that was our particular setup, our particular application, and that, that could well be. So I had a, a slight branch off from that point. So in uh, in economics, there's this price of monopoly, right? So if everyone were to sample the cheapest provider of a good or service, that will result in a monopoly. And then there's a certain modeled behavior of how monopolistic prices will behave. And so it's a nice closed world where you say, you know, in the long run, I'd like to prevent a monopoly, not because it's morally good, but it's because it's going to make for more efficiency. So are there counterparts to that? Uh, it's going to make for more if the monopoly creates more efficiency. No, no, no. So I, I, we don't want a monopoly because monopoly will reduce efficiency in the long run. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and I think I think that what we're like the same effects we're seeing here as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um the people at Spotify actually call this um superstar economics, um, which mm -hmm. is basically um especially I think in music, it's that you know exposure. Uh, drives adoption actually also changes how you appreciate a, a, a piece of music. Um, you know, the more often you hear it, the more you like it actually uh, up to some point and then it goes down. Um, so, um, yeah, these, these recommender systems have the tendency to create these rich get richer dynamics that in the long run, um, they actually then decrease efficiency. So I think the analogy to the monopolist, um, you know, I think is very, uh, yeah, very real. And so there's there's another example where short-term rationality doesn't give you the long-term efficiency of the market. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Uh, over back to you, Manish. Thanks very much, Thorsten. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Shomin. Uh, Shridhar has uh, his uh, hand up. Uh, Shridhar, you want to go ahead, ask your question. Thanks, Manish. Am I audible? Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, it's interesting uh, use case. Uh, my question is: um, when an employer uh, uh, searches for a candidate, uh, we use some logic, uh, rank candidates, and display results. Okay, but the candidates listed on top may not be interested uh, in that particular uh, company. So is there any way where uh, both employers, uh, job description, skills, uh, and the relevance, as well as the candidate uh, interests, both are matched for a two-way relevance, and then rank? Uh, mm -hmm. That is the first question. And the second question is, when we rank and display a student, for example, um, a, a, a candidate with 50% relevance uh, get on the top, and a candidate with marginally different, uh, let us say 49.9% relevance, uh, goes to the bottom, maybe uh, some 10,000 below, depending upon the population. Uh, to avoid that, can we have a range? For example, there is no difference uh, or not much difference between 50% relevance and 49.9% relevance. Maybe we can take a, a, a range, uh, 50 to 48 or 50 to 49 or whatever be the range, and then display all the candidates uh, in the range um, to avoid any uh, or, or to get a parity. Uh, so these are the two questions, sir. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Manish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, both are great questions. Um, let me start with the first one. So there's kind of matching market setup. Um, yeah, uh, actually, we we had a paper at the DubDubDub conference last one um, that 
tries to exactly do that. Um, so it tries to reason about um, our estimated preferences of the applicants and the estimated preferences of the employers. And then to recognize that you can only make a match if um, if uh, both match and if both discover each other, right? Um, so if um, so it becomes this kind of global optimization problem now. If um, if I you know what I show to a, to a candidate is now a ranking of places where I believe the candidate will like that place. So it doesn't make sense to show anything that uh, you know, the candidate is probably not going to like. And I only show places where I believe the employer is also both going to see um, and like that candidate. Like see that candidate, I can simply, I know the ranking that I'm going to show to the employer. If that candidate would end up in position 10,000 for that employer, it doesn't make sense to rank this highly for uh, this employer highly for the candidate because they uh, won't be discovered. There are others that are ahead, right? So this becomes a big kind of global optimization problem, which is uh, kind of a pain to solve. Uh, we've come up with some strategies for doing that. But um, yeah, it's this kind of matching market and capacity constraints in terms of attention on both sides. Um, uh, the other question, um, um, wait, what was the other question again? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'll repeat, I'll repeat, uh, no, sorry. Uh, the, the, the other question is, um, uh, when we rank the relevant, uh, marginally a um, lower relevant, oh, for example, 50% yeah. relevant and 49.9 relevant, uh, the 49.9 relevance, uh, if the population is huge, may get listed uh, at the bottom, let us say a huge variance, so 50,000 below the list. Uh, but uh, generally, it doesn't make difference between uh, 50 percent and 49.9. Uh, is there any way to rank uh, on a range, let us say 50 to yeah. 49? There may be, may may get more candidates, uh, but it it, uh, it is up to the uh, employer to further filter, uh, maybe based on other criteria. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, um, basically that what I had in that second part of the talk, in a way does that um, without specifying fixed ranges. Um, and the reason why the kind of this method, you know, where, where we said, so the amount of exposure is supposed to be proportional to the merit. And the only way we can achieve this is uh, by introducing randomization or by amortizing over time. Because each for each individual ranking, I have to make a decision. Who comes into the first spot? Who comes into the second spot? Who comes into the third spot, right? And so there, there is this um, kind of distinction between uh, ex ante uh, fairness and ex post fairness. So in a way, almost every ranking is unfair ex post. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, once I've committed uh, like items to ranks, somebody is better off and somebody is worse off. So making individual ranking by itself fair, um, it's typically not possible just because we have a give a certain allocation uh, and that's it, right? Somebody happens to get the first spot. What we can strive for though is ex ante fairness, and that takes into account that we can randomize. So that we create almost like a fair lottery that says your chance of getting that much exposure or getting a good position here is fair. Um, then over time, if you just repeat that sampling often enough, um, hopefully the kind of ex ante fairness of kind of having a fair lottery of where you end up in the ranking also converges to an exposed fairness that 
like on average, you've gotten just the right amount of exposure that you should, even though each individual ranking was not necessarily fair, right? Somebody got the first spot and that person got lucky for there, right? Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting to distinguish between the ex ante and ex post. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Thorsten. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we are out of time. So uh, therefore, folks, I think we'll take and, and there are quite some more questions, but I think we'll take those questions offline um, at this point. Um, uh, personally, Thorsten, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, for the great talk. Uh, over to you, Manik. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank talk. You. We, we ran over a little bit. Thorsten, do you have five, ten minutes? Can you take one more question or uh, do you have to run and we'll wrap up? I, I can take one more question. Oh, if you can, uh, oh. th there is uh, an interesting question. Ranking algorithms are typically influenced by uh, by by those those folks who actually interact with the portal, liking, sharing, commenting. But then uh, some folks may not interact at all. And is there a possibility to bring uh, to care for their long term engagement and bring them into the fold? A uh, very other similar question could be about instant answers. So several times instant answers are also carousal or list answers kind of things. And there, people just look at the answer and uh, they don't click, they don't interact at all. So how would you sort of you know, handle such cases? And... Yeah, uh, instant answers where there is no kind of engagement, I, I don't know. Um, the, um, like, uh, the, 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 the one where you have different types of users, some engage more, others engage less. I think those can also be addressed with these kind of propensity weighting techniques, right? So if you know that, um, you know, a certain user engages less. Um, every time you see an engagement, um, you upweight it um, kind of proportional to the probability that you would miss it. And so you could, for example, have a propensity model that now says, okay, here are certain types of users. Um, and uh, my observation probability, again, of seeing feedback from them is different. And I correct for that with inverse propensity weighting. Got it. Yep. Uh, yes, there was also another hand up, but I don't see it up anymore. So, uh, yep. But, but, uh, Devendra, may, maybe you had a question. So, if you want to put up or uh, otherwise. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, I just wanted to ask that uh, basically, we have a platform where bidding happens, right? And traditionally, we knew that uh, advertisers are truthful. So does steering long term dynamics affect truthfulness in any way? And that's I mean, I just wanted to know your comments on this. Uh, effect, uh, sorry, what I'm I'm actually not that. Um, what I'm really not considering here is the uh, the ad placement space where you have explicit bids and auctions. Um, so I, I didn't catch the word. Um, yeah, so uh, so basically uh, when we have an auction, uh, we are kind of maximizing the social welfare. And basically advertisers bid truthfully uh, based on theories nice. like second price auction, right? So does steering long term dynamics affect truthfulness in any way? Um, I have not thought at all how this would play out in an ad market um in a way yeah no i i haven't so not going to speculate <laughs> okay thanks um, that's my question okay thank you thank you thorsten thank you so much for the wonderful talk and uh, um, being so kind and considerate with your time for question answering thank you yeah thank you it was uh, was really fun Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and uh, was really was really a fun experience. All right. Yes, bye bye. Thank you so much, Thorsten. And I hope we can have you in person sometime in the future. That would certainly be nice. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye bye. bye bye. Thank you everyone. Thanks.